So, yeah, we're going to carry on with the teaching now. So, yeah, Father, we thank you for your word again, and we thank you that you uh, enjoy us unpacking um, your word. You want us to search the depths of what you've said and what you've written, Lord, and you want us to rejoice in what you've accomplished on the cross, Lord, and and given us abundant life, Lord. And it doesn't mean everything's going to be tiptoeing through the tulips, but it means that we can um, we can um, embrace you, Lord God, and you in turn will draw near to us, Lord, if we do that. So help us to do that tonight, to draw near to you, the true and living God, in Jesus' name. Amen. So anyone who would be um, looking at Revelation chapter 4 would start off in Ezekiel chapter 1. Yes. Ezekiel chapter 1. Right, that? Approximately halfway through your Bible. No one else, uh, oh, gosh, I've got it back from my oh, <laughs> Did you open it? That's the one thing. It's because it's in your Bible, Ellen. <laughs> <laughs> about halfway through your Bible. No, probably about um, two thirds of the way through. Just don't it. What was the Chapter 1. This is Ezekiel. It's in the Babylonian Babylonian exile. He's in uh, Jerusalem prophesying. Oh, sorry, he's in uh, Babylon. Um, in the thirteenth year. It, in Babylon. Yeah, when it was the exile. This is the time when he was prophesying. It doesn't actually matter what time he was doing that, but I just, you know, because we're not doing about the exile tonight. But we just this, <coughs> this image that he gets of God in the thirtieth year, in the fourth month of the fifth day, while I was among the exiles on by the Kebar River. The heavens were opened, and I saw visions of God. On the fifth of the month, it was the fifth year of the exile of King Jehoiachin. The word of the Lord came to Ezekiel, the priest, son of Buzi, and by the Kebar River in the land of the Babylonians. There the hand of the Lord was upon him. I looked, and I saw a windstorm coming out of the north, an immense cloud with flashing lightning, and surrounded by brilliant light. The centre of the fire looked like glowing metal, and in the fire was what looked like four living creatures. Just, just park that in your mind, four living creatures. Mm-hmm. In appearance, their form was that of a man, but each of them had four faces and four wings. Their legs were straight, their feet were like those of a calf, and gleamed like burnished bronze. Under the wings of the four sides, they had the hands of a man. What is this thing? All four of them had faces and wings, and the wings touched one another. Each one went straight ahead, but they did not turn as they moved. Their faces looked like this. Each, had, each of the four had a face of a man, and on the right side, he had the face of a lion, and the left an ox. Each had a face of an eagle, such were their faces. Their wings were spread out upwards, each had two wings, one touching the wing of another creature on each side, and two wings covering its body. Each one went straight ahead. Wherever the spirit would go, they would go, without turning as they went. The appearance of the living creatures was like burning coals of fire, or like torches. Fire moved back and forth among the creatures. It was bright, and lightning flashed out from it. The creatures sped back and forth like flashes of lightning. As I looked, the living creatures, I saw a wheel on the ground beside each creature with four faces. Is anyone confused? Because I am. Yeah. This was the appearance and the structure of the wheel. They sparkle like crystallite. All four looked alike. Each appeared to be made like a wheel intersecting a wheel. As they moved, they would go in any one of four directions, the cre- creatures faced. And the wheels did not turn about as the creatures went. What? Their rims were high and awesome, and all four rims were full of eyes all around. Okay. Just a little bit more. When the living creatures moved, the wheels beside them moved, and when the living creatures rose from the ground, the wheels also rose. Wherever the spirit would go, they would go, and the wheels would rise along with them, because the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. When the creatures moved, they also moved. When the creatures stood still, they also stood still. And when the creatures rose from the ground, the wheels rose along with them, because the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. Spread about above the heads of the living creatures what looked like an expanse, sparkling like ice and awesome. Under the expanse, their wings were stretched out towards the other, and each had two wings covering its body. When the creatures moved, I heard the sound of their wings, like the roar of rushing waters, like the voice of the Almighty, like a tumult of an army. When they stood still, they lowered their wings. Then there came a voice from above the expanse, above their heads, as they stood with their lowered wings. Above the expanse of their heads was what looked like a throne of sapphire, and high above on the ground was like a figure of that of a man. I saw what appeared to his waist... Up he looked like glowing metal, as if full of fire, and that from there down he looked like fire, and brilliant light surrounded him. Like the appearance of a rainbow, remember that, in the clouds on a rainy day, so was the radiance around him. This was the appearance of the lightness, of the glory of the Lord. When I saw it, I fell face down, and I heard the voice of the one speaking. Now, we're not going to go on, because I just want to give you that as a 
general overview of what Ezekiel said approximately 600 BC before Christ. Just a really quick thing if anyone's struggling to picture that I've actually got an artist rendition of this. There's a million of them on YouTube. Yeah. Okay. Well, I can't actually, I can't actually it. imagine it. If it's God, let me know. He's probably ringing up saying you're on the wrong track. Can I just... So, oh yeah. Oh yeah, that's just weird. But you get a clearer view when we go to Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4. So getting to Revelation chapter 4, we've obviously had to go through 1, 2, and 3. And chapters 2 and 3 took about two months to do, because that's the seven churches, and we've done that now. And interestingly, the first word in chapter 4 was metatauta in Greek, which means after these things, after this, right after this. This is not, there's no gap. This is metatauta. It's a famous kind of Greek um, way to put it together. And it's telling you that after these churches have all come to an end, it's that this is when that happens. So let's look at chapter 4. After this I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. Just bear in mind the last church of Laodicea. He said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Mm. After this I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven, and the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of Jasper, which is suspicious that it might be a diamond, and carnelian. Who's got a different word for carnelian? Sardin. Sardin, yeah. So, not everyone, so people have attempted to find out what's actually being said here and put their interpretation. It doesn't matter, it's just jewels, okay? This is speaking of splendour and glory and might, okay? Um, a rainbow resembling an emerald, encircled the throne. Remember that in Ezekiel? Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, and seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumbling and peals of thunder. Sound familiar? Before the throne, seven lamps were blazing, and they, they are the seven spirits of God. We're going to unpack that tonight. And before the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass. Familiar? Clear as crystal. In the centre around the throne were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in front and behind. Familiar? The first of the creature was like a lion, the second like an ox, the third of the face of a man, and the fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under his wings. Day and night they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Why is the three holies? The Trinity. The Trinity. <coughs> God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honour and thanks to him who sits on the throne and him who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever, lay their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive honour and glory and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created. Um, right, so just, on the end of, just go to the end of chapter 5 really quickly. Just the end of chapter 5, and it's verse 13. Do you remember what we just sang? To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and honour, glory and power forever and ever. Yeah, that's that's why we're singing that song. Um, I think there's another bit as well, which actually... It's a bit further, I think. Yeah, it's there, just um, after chapter 6, 7. So that song was made up of actual scripture. There we go. 7, 10. Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And a little bit further... Praise and glory, wisdom and thanks, honour and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. We're just repeating what they said, so we're just giving high praises to God. Just thought I'd point that out. Um, they lay their crown up, like ten. The twenty-four elders fall down before Him who sits on the throne and worship Him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, "Worthy are You, O God, Lord and God, to receive glory and honour and power. You created all things, and by Your will they were created and have their being." All right, so that's an interesting study for Monday morning. What does that mean? You created everything, they have their being. There's another scripture that says, in him we live and move and have our being. So never get one of those days when you feel like, where's God? And I feel like I'm a, the worst Christian ever. Just remember, in him 
you live and move and have your being. Your being is in him. If you're a Christian, that is. I mean, if you want to just walk your own way and do your own thing. But if you want to get on board with what God said, if you want to follow him, if you want to make Jesus the central, you know, the, the Lord God of your life, then you can um, have this life that he's promising, an abundant life where he helps you through all this stuff. So I'm going to unpack some of this. And um, this is the throne room of God, okay? And what's happened with John, John's been told to observe the church age, the seven churches through Revelation 2 and 3. Met it out after this I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven. Now, the most ludicrous belief of Christianity is something called the harpazo, the snatching away of Christians from the earth in the very last times. It's called the rapture. People call it that because that's the Latin word for it. It's called the rapturo, but it's, they call it the rapture. And that means that millions and millions of believers, true believers in Christ, are going to be snatched away from the earth. Ludicrous. It's like, what? Do you really believe that? Well, when I study the Bible, I can't. It's, it's already happened to people. People have been snatched away. Can anyone know, tell me who's been snatched away from the earth? Individuals. Elijah. Elijah. Who's first? Um. Enoch. Okay. So Enoch got took away from the earth, and um, he walked with God, and he, God took him. Right. Elijah was snatched away. A bit more of a public thing that, because it's recorded in Scripture. Jesus was ascended into heaven. Okay. And these are all forerunners to say that this is the, the destiny of the believer. Okay? God is going to instantaneously have you in his throne room. Okay, And this opening part here tells you a little bit that this is going to happen. Let's just turn. I always forget where this is, but it's in Thessalonians. So be turning towards Thessalonians. It's either one Thessalonians or two. Where's Thessalonians? I can never find it. Someone's took it from my Bible. It's one Thessalonians. <coughs> Alright, so it's 1 Thessalonians and it's it's 4, four 13. 13 will start. Do you also want to read that? 13 to 18. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. The Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Isn't that cool? So people have died in the Lord before. Oh, they'll, is. they'll. What's that? They'll rise first. Yep, yeah, they'll rise first, and then those who are alive, and we are hoping it's this generation that is taken. We don't know. There's no, you know, no. time scale. We don't. When it's imminent, you can. You don't know what's going to happen. Um, and then suddenly you'll go bang. You'll be in the throne room of God, and in the twinkling of an eye. One Corinthians 15. We could pad this out a bit, but I didn't want to do tonight on the rapture because we've done that before, and. But it's just a fact, a biblical fact. You've got the trumpet call there. You've got the being instantaneously moved away from this earth. And that's what's being reflected in chapter 4. Or so we can deduce from the scriptures. Okay? So we don't want to be dogmatic tonight and say, that's it. But it looks pretty much like it. Mm-hmm. you know. And the, the big key there is, after these things, after the church age, bang. You know what I mean? Um, so I'm, I'm only reading you what I'm reading you know, and making, trying to make sense of it. So what we don't do here is say, this is what it says, and it doesn't say anything else. But we try and build a model of so what we're reading. So you're saying it's a pre-truth, because it says yeah. after the church age, yeah. that's what's going to happen. Yeah, but some people would argue that it's somewhere else, but I'll tell you that when we come to it, and it, I don't think it's got much. Because what's this? Yeah. It sounds just like it, doesn't it? It sounds like it this is it. So we, we're happy to say after the church age, and we don't know when that is, but we know this is the church age, and we know it's the end of the church age mm-hmm. that God is going to cause this this snatching away. And that will be a world event like never, ever seen. All around the world, it will be absolute chaos because one and a half billion people will disappear from the earth. 
accountants, lawyers, teachers, people flying aeroplanes. Well, that's to solve the overpopulation. <laughs> <laughs> what about the children? Well, children, yeah, children. So what happens if you get this age of accountability? So in God, you, you, you get, you know, when babies are born, they don't know the sinners. And when young children, they don't know the sinners. But then there's an age of accountability. And that's why parents should be saying to the kids, hey, you know what? You've got to get on board with Jesus because there's lots of stuff coming and it's coming soon. You know what I mean? According to what the scriptures tell us, this is happening imminently. You know, we don't know. It could be tonight. You know, it could it's be now. Not, it could be now. It's not really a specific age as well. It's more of a developmental milestone that yeah. hits at, like, different times and different people's so sadly we live in a world where children get culled in the womb you know abortion and things like that and um, that's something that happens and they are not accountable for their life or anything so they'll go to heaven and all young children who sadly might die as a, a young age and bombs and things like that they'll go to heaven as well but once someone realises you know what I'm actually a, I've actually committed a sin and we don't know what that age is it's different for others it's, it's, it's 24 for Dan. Dan doesn't know when he's sick, <laughs> but, but, but it's like, you just know when you're a kid that you've stole a biscuit and you've stole something. Mm-hmm. It's probably not so bad if you steal a biscuit. Well, yeah, it is actually. It's really not. But, you know, you go in your mum's purse for like $50 and, like, you know, and then they get that feeling of, what are you doing? That's mm-hmm. kind of like, you know. That's kind yeah, of Yeah, and then that's the time when you think, and I think it, it gets real and you go, and I remember, when it, I don't remember the first time it happened, but I remember as a teenager getting up to some stuff and going, I don't actually feel really good about this. <laughs> I actually feel very bad. You know, so, um, and that kind of led me to thinking a lot about what's going on. Why do I feel bad? Why do I even care about feeling bad? What's going on? That I've got the inner feeling of, like, I'm missing something here. You know, and, and, and then it turns out that 22 years of age, I became a Christian and, and God forgave me for all those sins because I went to him, you know, just realising that the cross that he died on was God's wrath averted from me onto Jesus. You know what I mean? So I'm like, what? God's made it that Jesus takes the, the punishment for my sin and, the, and the, the, the door to accessing that forgiveness is uh, just believing in him. You know, believing, not believing that he was an historical figure, but believing that God would do that and he, he, he'd bring out a plan where Jesus would become the sole focus of his wrath and all the wrath for my sin and your sin. And he pours out his wrath on Jesus, thus letting me off. But the, but you can't just go, thanks God, I'll just go and sin. You go, the requirement is to follow Jesus and to say, now I've done this bit, the ball's in your court. What are you going to do about it? Do you want to follow Jesus? Do you want to go your own way and just risk it? You know. And we always talk about the driving seat, don't we? So it's like, say this is a driving seat in a car. I'm in the driving seat. I'll, oh, I'll live my life, crash, run a few people over. You know, cops, 15 cops behind me, you know, all that kind of thing, metaphorically. Or when you become a Christian, you say, you know, I don't want to do this anymore. I want Jesus to be sat in this seat running my life, you know. And that's what it is. You get out of that seat and you say, Jesus, forgive me for my sins. You know, sit in this seat. I want to give my life over to you. I realise that you're the king of kings. What this says is true about you. You did come to save mankind and you did come to set us free from sin and death. I want to be a person who, who buys into that, what do I do? And the Bible says, if you confess Jesus Christ with your mouth and believe in your heart that he's the son of God, then you will be saved. But it's got to be real. It's got to be, you know, not like for just a sort of like thing. And I think this is why we do what we do here, because there's nothing going to bring you here. It's not impressive. It's not like lights, smoke machines and loud music, is it? It's actually really bad worship. It's, really, it's like, you know, we warble away a little bit. I feel like that sometimes. But, you know, it's the op- opposite thing. So we say, you know, we, we're not going to offer you anything that's going to entertain and, and coax you into some kind of benefit. It's just Jesus. We just want to unpack his word, lift him up high, and just have great, sweet fellowship as a family. Sounds all right? Mm-hmm. Let's keep doing that then. Do you have a question? Yeah, well, just, just I've forgotten what it means to say, at once I was in the spirit. All right, so so what's happening is that he's he's oh, God's already doing a number on him because he's seen this church age stretched out over mm-hmm. chapters two and three, but then it seems that he's um, it, it must be terminology that when we are resurrected because the rapture the harpazo is the resurrection of the dead. It's when God resurrects the dead. He says, "I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he was dead, yet shall he live." Okay, that's what Jesus said. And that's what, you, that's what you do when you become a believer. You, you get put into the resurrection. And when he speaks your name, you will rise from the dead. You know, you come up. 
So he says, come up here. And he's personal. He says it to John, you come up here. And he'll say it personally to everybody. And then when that happens, you go from death or this body to a new glorious body. What God's going to do at the resurrection body. And your references for that is 1 Corinthians 15, among many. But I'm just giving you... We haven't even started what we're going to talk about tonight. But, uh, here he's, he's got the... Because John was alive afterwards. Yeah. So he made a, a trip to heaven. Looks like so, it, doesn't it? God was playing fun and games with John. He's like, he pretty okay, much was, I'm yeah. going to freak you out. And just in case I haven't freaked you out enough, come with me, friend. Yeah. So he did that. He did a number, like, he very poetically said, on John. Yeah. And I bet John was had a bit of a migraine afterwards. Like, <laughs> yeah. I've just seen God. Do you remember yeah. um, the Christmas stories, you know, where it's Ebenezer Scrooge, Scrooge or whatever, and he gets taken and he gets to see what he's really like from, like, that hmm. other realm? Oh, right, yeah, yeah. That yeah. kind of, that makes yeah. me think of that. It's like, hmm. you know, you're sort of not in that dimension. You're in, the other, in a different dimension. Yeah, out looking in. Yeah. And don't forget, God exists outside of time and in time and at the beginning of time. And at the end of time, all the time. So <laughs> he can he can do what he pretty much wants with yeah. with time and you. So he's showing things that have not happened yet, you know. And um, but we've got it written down so that we know what to expect. Okay, because later on we're going to find out that these twenty four elders is represents the church in heaven. And um, something happens later on where. John is weeping and he's uncontrollably sobbing. The Greek word is he's beside himself because no one can be found worthy to open the scroll, which is the deed title to the earth. Because in the beginning, the earth was handed over to Satan and Satan became the prime minister of the earth because Adam and Eve and all that kind of thing. So that's a legal thing what happened. But that this scroll is the undoing of that legal thing. It's the t- title deed to the earth. And John's so beside he, himself. No one could find him. That scroll was sealed up when Adam and Eve sinned. Um, well, basically, um, and then the, 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 when Jesus died on the cross, and when he, he did more than just save your soul, okay, he, he completely restored everything. Everything in the universe was consumed by the cross. Not just your sin, not just your death. Okay? And um, it was everything. God took everything and put it in Christ, because he could, because Christ was the innocent one. Okay? Christ wasn't guilty of anything. He died in our place. And then he died with that. And it became the end of all things. And that's why Jesus said the um, the the um, tetelestai, which is the Greek word for the, bu- uh, the books are balanced. It's an accounting term. We've got a robot in the room for anyone who's listening to this. So, um, so it's tetelestai, which means um, the price is paid, some people say, or the books are balanced, which is more of a so when the books were balanced, it means that God has won back everything that was lost in the garden when it was handed over to Satan. So I know this is a lot of words and it's a bit complicated, but hopefully you're sticking with it. You know. Is that why they had the term born again? Because everything was reset, basically, when he died on the cross. Well, well, born again is a Jewish term. You get born again seven times in Jews, but not the way we are born again. They call it, when you have a bar mitzvah in, in Israel... That's like a, a, um, 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 a, a rite of passage. So, so you have seven of them, but only the teacher of Israel can have the full seven and then have these, these rites of passage to be born again. And the term came about because he said, because Jesus was saying, you must be born again. But, and the teacher of Israel, because he was talking to Nicodemus, is like, I'm the teacher of Israel. I'm the, the guy, the only guy in the country who's been born again the, the full number of times, which was seven times. Not born again of the spirit, but it's a term used for reaching a certain oh, okay. level of teaching and maturity in Israel. So Jesus said, you must be born again, but not by flesh and blood, mm-hmm. by the spirit. So he's, he was using his language to win him over. You see, and whether he did or not, I think he did, though, because of later things. Didn't he ask Jesus to Not sure. Where would that be? Jesus didn't baptise anyone. And yeah, that's interesting. Because he got other people to do it, you know. Don't baptize people. It's not like, ooh, just when they believe, baptize them. I suppose some people could then make that like a special rank. Yeah. I was baptized by Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. And you were, mm-hmm. you, you weren't just sort of thing. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 So, my friend in Britain, who's coming over in January, he's got a bath upstairs, and he actually, if some if someone believes, he goes, "What well, do you want to get baptized?" And they go, "What now?" He goes, "Yeah." 
<laughs> I've got these clothes that they can wear and be baptised and all that kind of thing because it's in the Bible it was supposed to be instantaneous. Yeah. You know, if you believe, you get baptised and that's it. So, anyway. They've got like a home video of Bethany getting baptised as well, don't they? Have they? I don't yeah. know. Yeah, <laughs> so. hey, we better move on because I've got a lot to get through. We might not get through it all tonight. So, that was the first couple of verses. Um, so, to me, that could be the rapture. Very strong possibility, I believe it could be for many reasons. The first few verses. At once he was in the spirit, and there before he was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian, or whatever your word is. A rainbow resembling an emerald circled the throne. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, and seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their head. Now later we find that they sing a song of redemption to God. They've got a crown on their head and they're dressed in white. Now if you know anything about the Bible... You know that the believers, every believer, when they get took up into heaven, will be dressed in white, will have a crown on their head, and they'll be singing redemption songs to Jesus. So it's, this is the church, represented by 24 elders. I could get complicated and tell you where the 24 elders appear in the Old Testament, because it's alluding to that. Um, for the, the rainbow around the throne, inside into an emerald, what does that mean? It like shows like an little shine. It's more like a halo, so if you've got the throne like that, you'd have like a rainbow completely encircling that whole situation, it seems. So. Um, what does it have to do with the emerald, though? What? What does it have to do with the emerald, though? The emerald is a jewel, jewel is shiny, the halo is shiny. No, so, so when we look at colour, because we've been, you know, science has shown us that colour is um, uh, how frequency and. And all that kind of thing. We look at it and we don't go, oh, a rainbow looks like like jewels. But there, he's he, in his mind, he doesn't know about you know um, refraction and is it refraction? Yeah. And he, so he's going, well, it's like it's like. And if you were looking at, it, you go, it's like a. If you saw a rainbow for the first time, you go, it's like loads of jewels. You know, have you ever seen a really strong rainbow in the sky? Yeah. yeah. Solid. You're like, whoa, look at that. It's awesome. And and. And it also means a covenant as well, because um, in in Noah, yeah. you, know, it's, you know, the flood, um, God said, I will not flood the earth again. Inside, and, he, and he produced the rainbow in the sky. And God, only God can bring the rain. Right? So just remember this. This is a central thing for tonight. Only God can bring the rain for light to go through. Right? So um, when you talk about rain in the scriptures... It's very much about the Holy Spirit's work on earth, okay? And the way, the way the Holy Spirit comes down, and it's like he rains down on us, and he can come now if he wants. Do you, do you sense him in the room now? I don't know. I'm too busy doing this to kind of... But, you know, and he can he can be amongst us, and he is here. It's just that he sometimes turns up to 11, and you can sense that God's here by his presence and all that. And, you, and um, we can't guarantee no one tries to whip it up mm. in here. But... Uh, a lot of people are trying to make the rain. They're trying to make it rain. And only God, the, the rainbow's at God's throne room. And he's the only one who can initiate the rain. Do you know what I mean? The Holy Spirit's work on earth. But people try and whip it up. And all that kind of thing. So we're trying to avoid that. Because why would you want to whip up something that only God can do? Anyway, leave that one with you. Right, is this making sense? Is it everyone all right? to mention because it says here um, and the one who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Ruby well mm. Jasper is like comes in all sorts of different colours mm. and is um, and if it isn't Jasper then it's a diamond which reflects mm. all sorts of different colours mm. and Ruby's red obviously which to me reminds of the blood that Jesus mm. you know, shed you know, to save our sins but then he's you know like I don't know brilliant he's got, he has, he's got control of all the colours I don't know I just think those two colours are what I love about this is that Jasper probably is a diamond, and the, the person sat on there looks like you're radiating all different. Can you yeah. imagine that? That's our God. But yeah, we're well, still reminded of the blood that he shed, which is red. Yeah. yeah. Because he, he mentioned red. Why would? Because obviously a diamond can also reflect red. Yeah. But he also mentioned red as a yeah. Very yeah. So how cool is that? So cool. So a rainbow resembling an emerald. So so John's looking at it and thinking, I can't really place. He's probably seen rainbows before, but he's like. This one's probably more vivid and solid, and mm -hmm. I don't know. It might. I don't know. We don't really know much about this except what we can read. Are all emeralds green? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 
So it's the same word as a, it's like a halo more than a rainbow. Yeah. Um, I think of it like um. Do you, do, you, do you ever see? Oh. Do you ever see like in the night when you have a full moon and then the, it has like a moon halo around it? Mm-hmm. Um, has anyone ever seen it? Yeah. Yeah. I kind of see it, envision it a bit like that, like that halo. It's uh, a bit like a red. Rainy shine. Rainy as well, isn't it? Yeah. Ah, okay. I'm going to ch- chuck something at you in a minute which I don't think you've heard before because this is, let's just get on with it because we're going to take absolutely ages over this but that's a good point like surrounding it mm-hmm. it's definitely encompassing okay. just trying to put a thing in your head about what who this is we're serving you know this is God and um, I just think it's amazing that you've got several versions of what, how he looks through the scriptures and they're all quite similar from people who didn't even know each other right, so it's always got that glow and the... Mm. Mm. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones and seated on them were 24 elders. We'll meet them later, so I'm leaving that there. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumbles and peals of thunder. Before the throne, seven lamps were blazing. Right. Seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. Uh, also before the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. Now then, if you have rain coming down and lamps what do you get light hitting rain produces what rainbow right so um, this is only coming from the text i don't i can't not saying that this is what i'm just put you can be a bit imaginative about what's going on as long as you don't drift into false teaching and trying to gain and get because you're just telling them wrong things it's ridiculous so but these are the seven spirits of god now this is a study in itself, and um, just turn to um, Isaiah 11. How many colours is the rainbow now? Visibly seven, and that's what we're gonna. You sprung my trap. <laughs> you sprung my trap. I was gonna talk about the seven, everything before this throne of God, seven, and it's seven colours. <laughs> Sorry, what were you gonna... looking at? Isaiah 11. Isaiah 11. Go back to sleep. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, yeah. Just start reading Isaiah 11 from the beginning. Anyway. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and the branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall One. rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel Three. and might, the spirit of knowledge and Four. the fear of the Lord. Five. His delight is in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge Three, by the sight of his eyes, nor the sight. All right, just go back a bit. Just start reeling off those spirit of things. The spirit of the Lord, then. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Seven. So, we're not saying that this is what it says and that's where we're going to, but the seven, it's the sevenfold spirit of God. There's one spirit... But there's seven aspects to that one spirit, okay? It's not seven spirits, it's one Holy Spirit. But then these things here um, are listed. Um, the Holy Spirit himself, wisdom, understanding, counsel, power, knowledge and fear. When the Holy Spirit's at work, them are the things that are being engendered in his people. Not fear as in, oh, but it's fear, healthy respect. Yeah, all, all, all. Have you ever been in a, a situation where there's an authority figure where you're going... If I don't actually, you know, act pretty um, respectful, I'm in trouble, <laughs> you know. And it's like that with God. Uh, not that He's He's there with a baseball bat waiting for you to, yeah. bang, you know what I mean. It's but never hurt. It's always a discipline. Like you've yeah. got to do this as a discipline. It's never. Like, if I don't do this, I'm going to get myself hurt. You know. Yeah. So so you've got like the wisdom should be being engendered in people who are genuinely being, you know. Walking with the Lord, the Holy Spirit's working in there. Um, understanding, you know, and that can take a long time. Counsel, power, knowledge, and fear. The fear of the Lord. The healthy respect of this enormous God who can speak things and they just happen, right? Don't mess, is generally. But then he, he brings us on board as a child. When we cross the line and say, you know what, I want to be a Christian, I want to believe in Jesus, I want to follow him. We also get adopted by him. He becomes a loving father. He's always wanting to love us, but we can't get there for the sin, what's involved in us. And he needs to. we need to get to a place where he's um, able to 
get on the inside of our life, and that's it's what we can Christmas. It's a seven-fold delight in the fear of the Lord, because I've got wisdom, understanding, counsel, mind, knowledge, and Fear of the Lord. Yeah. And, and it's number yeah. seven. Um, I don't know whether they've written down. I'm not even in Isaiah 11. You tell me. <laughs> um, two. Yeah, there is one. The Spirit of the Lord Himself. Don't oh, forget that one. Yeah. Okay, so that's the second one. Uh, okay. I've written down wisdom, understanding, counsel. The, these are all the spirit of power, knowledge, and fear. Yeah. Right, doll. And you've got in, in different. It's all the spirit of. The spirit of, of and it's a fa- sevenfold spirit, sevenfold aspects of one spirit. So these things are being engendered. You've got the gifts of the spirit, which are things that God, such as the graces, where He enables you to be um, useful to others. So basically, mm-hmm. I'm not a Bible teacher, but you have a Bible teacher. Does that make it? Can you see that? That's different. So I'm not a gift. You are gifted, hopefully, with a Bible teacher. Do you see what I mean? It's like it's like looking at it differently. So if you, if someone say, let's think now, um, is like Becky can be quite prophetic, right? Prophetic, right? She speaks out, and not, not Helen's not been not doing it as well, <laughs> speaking it as prayers, but actually speaking out things which has been like a word of knowledge. Well, that's a gift to all of us, but you're not the gift. It's coming through you from God. Do you get it? You're just a vessel. You know? That's why they've got gifts us. And God's designed it that way, that in a church, that people are interdependent. Not independent, not dependent on somebody, but interdependent. So in other words, the things that I need spiritually uh, will come from you. Do you know what I mean? Because you're the body everyone of Christ. Needs everyone else. Yeah, there you go. But it's, um, it's a bit more technical than that, but anyway. Um, right, let's move on with this. Um, there are seven spirits of God, sevenfold spirit of God. Also before the throne was what looked like a sea of glass clear as crystal. In the centre, around the throne, were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in front and behind. The first living creature was like a lion, the second like an ox, the third had a face like a man, the fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under his wings. Day and night they never stopped saying, holy, holy, holy. It's the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. The explanation for that, I have not got a clue. Except it's a song, it's a nice one. People have said that they represent the four Gospels. So people have said it, I don't know that it's true. The first one, Matthew presents the Lion of Judah, because Matthew's written to the Jews. So he represents the Lion of Judah. The second one is, um, what is the second one? Um, no. It was an ox. So that's Mark, because Mark's... Greek text is full of the word, immediately Jesus did this, immediately did this. And an ox in Jewish thinking is somebody who's, who's wor- a worker. Jesus was a worker. He worked miracles. He did things and he helped people and he God worked through him that way. The third one was a man. And Luke presents Jesus as a man, uh, the human being, the humanity of, God, of Jesus. Jesus wasn't like this. He didn't float 10 foot above the ground. He was an actual 100% man while being 100% God. And the thing that will bake your noodle all your days, if you want to understand this, is why would God come as a man? Right? <laughs> and then the last one is um, is coming out of the... Um, <laughs> so, and then the fourth gospel is John, who presents God as the divine son of God, which is like the eagle, you know? Flying way above, you can see all, everything, you know. So that some people say that's that's what these creatures are. So we don't know anything about them. No, I don't know. Ah, Do you? Can okay. you offer anything? Because I haven't got a clue. <laughs> they're um, symbolic because they're mentioned elsewhere in the Bible in several verses, but as to exactly what they symbolise, there's no clue. Yeah. Yeah, it's not easy to get everything signed off. It's it's just a fact. It is what it is. If God shows you this thing, and it's just like. You can try and superanalyze it, but he might be just showing you just how powerful, glory, and mighty he is, and there's no explanation. Well, you just go. Those, those creatures, those I found them very disturbing. Yeah. Lines and yeah. See, I find it the opposite. I find them comforting, like guardians also. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. Well, 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 ye
So the ox is like the picture of the worker. Mm -hmm. and what gospel was that? Mark. Jesus. I can't remember where that scripture is. What? Where's the uh, mention of the cherubim? Oh, guardian angels. Um, Some people said that these are guardian angels. Right. And I'm like, don't appear in my bedroom at night. No, I, I am running out of the house. No, no, just me find them creepy. No, 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 I find it a bit disturbing. Oh, they're, they're, they're creepy. They have eyes all over them. I mean, come on. You know, that means they've got eyelashes and it means they've got pupils and retinas. That is nothing but eyes looking at Yeah, it's cool. <laughs> no. Yeah, but there's a difference between the two. Yeah. Well, that's all right. No problem. Okay. Okay. Thank you for having us. That's all good. Thank you very much for coming. I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> that means you're coming to school tomorrow. I'm coming to school, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Does she come into school tomorrow? Um, I think so. Are you in work placement? No, Tuesday. Yeah, it comes. Isn't it? You tell me, I don't know. <laughs> well, yeah, because it's ag, yeah, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, 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 you do that, yeah. Okay. Okay. It's the Matthew Matthew was written to Jews, all right. So when you talk about the um, Jesus, he was in the tribe of Judah, right? And um, and this, you know, the they call him the Lion of Judah when he returns because he's not coming like a yeah. soft lamb and shepherd. He's coming like a fierce, furious lion to judge the nations. Mm -hmm. Hail, hail, Lion of Judah. They say the lion is the king of beasts. Mm. So, <coughs> what, what's this about cherubim? Which um, chapter was it in again? Because it mentions eyes all over as well. Isaiah. That was that's a no, I don't know what you're referring to because these are animals and beasts, and it's only like a speculation that these are angels and cherubim. Nobody really knows what they are, but they seem to pop up all the time. You mentioned somewhere else in the time of the room of God. I need to find it. Because it says it's just, they've got six wings and they have eyes all over as well. Well, that's in Ezekiel chapter Ezekiel, 1. Ezekiel, yeah. Ezekiel chapter It's slightly different because well, it's. Just he's not in the throne room there. I'll find it later. All right, so um, so we've got these living creatures. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. That's what they keep doing. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honour and thanks to him who sits on the throne and he who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. He keeps saying him who lives forever and ever. You know, so just remember this is the eternal Lord of the universe that's being described. They lay their crowns before their throne. Now listen. If anything has happened over the last, uh, well, all the church age, there's a lack of men laying their crowns before the Lord. Okay, Because men still want to rule, they still want to reign, they still want to be in charge, they still want to take possession over goods and land and territory and, and rank and hierarchy. And, you know, if we ever warn through the ages to do anything, lay your crown before the Lord. If ever that temptation is to become, you know, like, above one another and above God, and uh, how would you ever do that? But if you ever did do that, it's a, it's a remnant from the fallen nature, and um, and it's you know it's always trying to get back into our life, and always trying to take its place. But this is this says they laid their crowns before God, whereas they were worshiping Him, and um, oh, that would do that today. I'm not saying any of you, I'm, you know. I'm, and, and God's took me through a process of saying, yeah, that was you at one time. You wanted all the glory. Uh, you painted Jesus on it. And then that was how you lived. But then he has to get underneath the surface and, surface and, um, and start to deal with the heart of a um, Saul and bring out the David. So they lay their crowns before the throne and say, you are worthy, O Lord and God, to receive honour and glory and power for you created all things and by your will they were created and have their being now let's just look at that let's just unpack that for you created all things they could have put full stop couldn't they mm -hmm. but then they carried on and said 
and by your will they were created and have their being this entity that's being described here and listen to this it can help you Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday wanted you to have an existence wanted you to have your being he willfully and joyfully created you and knew about your life this being he looks like a diamond and there's lights and thunder and he's got weird stuff going on around him and 24 elders chucking jewellery on the floor you know and and he's like that going yeah Kim it's awesome it's awesome that you are who you are it's awesome that you exist I wanted that to happen passionately with all wisdom with all goodwill Rachel same same for you all all you know wisdom and understanding went in the absolute micro facets of your life is known by God completely and he adores you and he wants you to just kind of you know really sit in that nice soft kind of beautiful love that God's got for you you know despite some dark thoughts you know just to kind of because we all get them and just you know I'm not going to listen to that because this this being here and you can always go back to remind yourself who it is is he, he willed and in, in his in his kind of like wisdom before the creation of the world he went I want Rachel I want um, Helen I want Zach I want you yeah, so I struggle with that sometimes I mean, welcome to the human race Bromwin why would someone <laughs> all knowing why would he want me yeah alright let's talk about that because that is the human condition I don't, I've never met anybody unless you're really arrogant or somebody who says oh yeah I completely get it the God I'm, I'm really worthy of being you know made by this it's almost like <gasps> What, this is the searching question of all time, isn't it? What is this? What the heck? Why, why, God? Because when I think about that, all I can think of is all the reasons why he wouldn't. Yeah. Okay, so through our lives, our fairly young lives, you can you can have experiences where the devil's come to seek, uh, kill and destroy, what is it? Steal, kill and destroy, right? So what he's trying to steal, kill and destroy, one of the things, is that connection to the fact that we are made in the image of God. And what we do is he gets our eyes and rigorously focuses us in, like, almost like makes us just stare all the time at our failings and our shortfalls and all the things that we're not going to, the way we've let ourselves down and others down, the way we've done this, this and this, and it's all gone wrong and there's been great tragedy and people are never going to be the same again. However, Jesus says, by the cross, he says, I've, I'm, I'm taking that away as not being your central focus. I'm going to ascend, I'm going to be on my Father's throne and this is what we're talking about. And because we're now there's going to be a lamb that was slain in the next chapter, which is also going to, you know, rock up to this scenario. And um, I don't want you to focus on that. It's real. That's not being, you know, he's not going to, he's not going to start giving you big green ticks on sin. He's not going to start, you know, signing off on wrongdoing and all that kind of thing. But he's just going to go, look, I know, I know your frame. I know how you're built. I'm just t- talking to everyone. I know how you are. I know every single inclination of your being. Every dark thought, every dark cul-de-sac, every possibility of darkness, I know it. Every possibility of, you know, you might actually do something good one day, I know it. But it's on the basis of the fact that while you were sinners, Christ died for us. He died for you despite the fact that we're all rubbish at this. And we don't get it right. And we don't, we trip up and we stumble and we fall. And we say sorry more times than we give praise to God, you know. And, and he's trying to get us better. He's trying to fix us. And the requirement is to be... Um, abandoning self to be um, um, working towards uh, yielding ourselves to him in other words when you yield it means that you're deciding that your strength is not going to be employed on this occasion so you say no to my strength that can can accomplish x y z and they'll say god I'm, i much prefer your abc so i'm going to not be strong in that i'm going to be purposefully and objectively saying no to that so abandonment and yielding and submission and submission is really difficult because it means that I actually think that I'm right but I'm going to choose to on purpose choose your way over mine so then things coming into play can start to rebuild a self perception of, of your own identity based upon God not on the information provided by a few years of rough travelling is that alright to say that? yeah yeah so what we do is we default to our, you know, purposed, you know, disasters, what we've done. And I'm talking about me as well, right? 
instead of going, wait, what does God say? What's God, my creator, who with full wisdom and understanding and full knowledge and ability to discern the first from the last about me, joyfully made me. But that's not my perception. I actually hate myself. I actually don't like myself. I actually, you know, I'm, you know, I, you know, sometimes at times when I, I, re- I um, um, I'm, I'm not happy. I lament my existence. You know, there's a lot of people that have, even small ways sometimes, but sometimes in big ways, and sometimes it goes, zzz, zzz, it all vacillates to big. Oh, I've got a dark day today. It's not so bad today. Sometimes it's gone. But then, the, and that's the devil steal, kill, and destroy. He wants you to not look at Jesus. He wants you to focus on you and all your shortcomings. And that's why he's built repentance into the atonement, that you can go to God with a contrite heart and say, God, I didn't, I, well, I don't know, I can't even say anything, but you can see my heart. I'm broken because I'm just not good at this at all. And I know that you're righteous and holy and you're this, you know, which is very intimidating. I'm made of diamonds. I'm made of diamonds and I've got rubies around me and weird animals with eyes all over me. <laughs> and I'm on a throne with a massive rainbow around me and there's lightning coming from me. And then he's picking up trash like me. <laughs> yeah, well, this is, this is the problem. You see, you're yeah. not trash and that's what he's stolen from you. Mm-hmm. That's, what, that's what has been yeah. stolen over years and it starts at an early age, it starts through school, it starts through media, it starts through TV, all that kind of thing and it chips away. It tells you that it's all right to kill a thousand people for one person. You know, <laughs> some movies are out there. You know, and, and you might think, well, you know, there's some trust in that. But actually, it just weakens the value of a human life. And if they're not worth that, then I'm not worth We're not really worth much, are we? Wrong. He's made of diamonds. <laughs> <laughs> what do you do with that? Yeah. Even if you remove all the bad stuff, I don't see that there's much good left to work with. But mm. clearly, God thinks there is. And yes. I, just, I wish I knew what God thought. Yeah. But this is where faith comes in, okay? So we're all in the same boat. Faith comes in when we go, even though the tale of the tape and the evidence says, I'm a moron, right? You know that I'm a moron because that information is probably true. But despite my moranity, is that a word? Moron. Moranity. No, right? it, yeah, yeah, probably. Yeah, it's probably proving to everybody that I am a moron. So, <laughs> so, so God Just goes... Like my the lack of ability to yeah. function. And, what, and, what, and what we have to do at some point, and this is really important now, is separate our beings from our doings. Okay. Now this society mixes them all up. And if you fail at something you've done, you feel like a failure. But you've no need to feel like that because you can say, I am not the sum total and parts of what I do. Mm-hmm. So God say, says, I see what you do and not, none of that's impressive, but I see who you are. And this is, and keep, just listen to this, just really listen to this, right? To receive glory and honour and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created, and have their being. being. That's what Doing. God's looking at. If you say, what does God like about me? He loves your being. Why? Which means your existence. Your existence. Mm-hmm. You're made in the image of God, and you're making decisions, even though you might make... 93 decisions, why 93? I don't know. 93 decisions which aren't great in a day. If you make a decision to go, you know what, God, I want to do your plan, is like one. This is it, we, we, we've got something to work with, you know? So, so this is what it doesn't say. You are worthy, O Lord and God, to receive glory and honour and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their doing. So the doing is important. He sees it and you need to deal with it and you need to work with it. But we need to shift focus and say, I'm not the sum total of my doing. I am a being separate from them things. And if you, if you can't separate because you, you've been in a bit of a dark place or you've done stuff that you still is nagging, well, that's probably the devil. And you're not living in the abundant life that God wants you to do it. So we've got to get before God. And part of our prayer isn't, Lord, shopping list. Uh, it's, you know what, God, I, I can't get free of this. I can't seem to move on from that thing. And some people in this room have had things that are really difficult to cope with. You know, and really, even tragedy, you know. So I don't, I don't, to try and, I'm not minimising it by saying, oh, you should feel great about your life. I'm saying, no, get before God, lay it all before him, tell him that you're having a tough time and it's not really working out for you, because he knows anyway, he just wants you to get, get to know that that's the case. And, um, and this is what I don't like about some churches out there that have got this triumphalism. 
you know, Jesus is alive, he rose from the dead, uh, that means that you should, and then you, when you hear the, hear the word should, it causes a problem because you go, I ain't that. It makes you feel abnormal for yeah. not feeling okay. Jesus saves and then you won't, but you carry on doing. What happens then? It's mm. all as well connected to that, it's guarding your mind, you're guarding your heart. Mm. But importantly though Helen and, and everybody else is that it's a strange thing really because we can go to formulas and we can go to a lot of things on the internet you can go to to get a better dot 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 or a more effective dot 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 or be, be you know you know somehow formulated getting a formula to fix the problem but the only way you'll ever fix the problem is by going to Jesus the author and perfecter of your faith you put your eyes on him and trust him that the he who started a good work will carry it on until completion okay He's going to do that. And, and the impatience comes in because we live in the microwave oven generation, remember? Ping! Three minutes later, everything's fixed, right? No, it's going to take a while. And this is why a lot of people jump off the bus and there's going to be a falling away in the last days because people want it now. I want it all. I want it now. I want it now, you know? And I, I can't wait. I can't wait for the fulfillment of your promise. I can't seem to, you know, and it's, an, it's, it's a pandemic that people want things now and can't wait and I'm, I'm like that about the I, I actually go through seasons sometimes I'm good at it but mostly I'm not good at it you know mm -hmm. I know that I've waited for things and things have come to pass because I've waited but do I kick and scream while I'm waiting you better believe it <laughs> oh my goodness honestly mm. I think God invented smacking because of me <laughs> so anyway did any, any of that make sense yeah. it's useful isn't it? I think it's useful isn't it? so it's, can I just ask another question that comes to mind? Is God's created everybody, right? So it's not just me that is a Christian that he sees the value. Right? Right. Yeah? God God created everyone, so it's not just me as a Christian that he, 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 he sees value. He sees value in everyone. Yeah. Everyone. Yeah. He sees he sees value in anyone who's decided that Jesus is gonna be the so he value so so when you know everybody who's been born into this world is God's creation, not his child. You've got to get that into your thinking. Mm -hmm. So people aren't his, they are his creation, but you don't get adopted as a child until you cross the line and say yes to Jesus, right? So that's when he adopts, because it says in Ephesians and all over, Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us that we can be called the sons of God. Sons, daughters, yeah. Um, and that's what we are, you know, John said. So so we, we've got to get past this whole kind of being and doing thing. It says it there, and you're being, you created our being, you know. And, uh, and to be in that place is quite good because you start to go, so let me just think this through. Even though I'm really not great at this, my intent to follow Jesus it puts a smile on God's face because that's by faith. Because that's by faith. I want to follow you, Lord, and I want to do better on the doing things. But your being is already totally approved by God because you're a child of God, made in his image, and you've been included in the new covenant. And you know you have because you wouldn't be sat here listening to me if you didn't. This is torture for someone who's not saved, you know? And, um, yeah, so... When I start feeling really down, I find it better to stop what I'm doing and take a moment to just... Hmm. and have a moment to myself that's completely silent and just be and I'll have to worry about what I need to do next hmm. what I need to do tomorrow what I need to do next week, next hmm. month, next year and then I think to myself if I've made someone smile hmm. that's a blessing that I've given to someone through God because I've brightened their day <clears throat> yeah, I think I think that's something that's really really good to do. I mean, there's a, don't forget yourself in that though, because um, it's not being selfish to say, hey, I need to be in a good place to help others, you know. Mm -hmm. And there's so many people who are not in a good place trying to help others, and it just becomes Even worse. yeah, and then that person falls off the radar because they've worn themselves out. We're trying to be Jesus to the world, you know. What I mean, I'm not saying that's what you're saying, but um, you know, make sure you get before God and say, you know. Hey, I need to be. I want to. I want to be whole, more whole, 
um, than I am. I want to experience this abundant life more. I don't want to be a robot. I want a relationship. And I want to come to my father and, and, and really feel that father and son thing occur. A connection. Um, connection. And, and don't panic if that's not something that has been going on in your life and you're finding it's dry and it's not happened for a while. And um, Oh, now, boys. But it hasn't happened for a while. Um, it's really important that you just keep persevering and keep getting before God and saying, I know the, 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 um, the short circuit is me right now. I'm not getting it. The, the word says what it says, that we're in him we live and move and have our being. You're in Christ, which is in God. You're intrinsically placed next to each other. You know, unless, of course, you, your doing has gone to such a point where you've gone away and you're doing your own thing and you're not even questioning what you're doing. And the Holy Spirit's you know, conscience within your life, you're not listening and there's a seared conscience going on um, where you just go, well, in that case, if God's not going to help me, then I'm not even going to do anything. Um, you know, and that becomes a cul-de-sac, and that's the prodigal son territory. But I don't think, I don't know. Do you know, I don't know how helpful this is, but, um, you know, I'm somebody who always feels that I'm, especially at this moment of my life, that I've failed everything, that I can't do anything right, that I'm an imbecile, that blah, blah, blah. And I go to town on that, I'm really good at that at the moment. Um, but then it, um, you don't realise that how many other people who are godly people are thinking the same way about themselves. Mm. It's just huge. I mean, I'm not, it's, it's simple, I think, yeah, you know, but in a certain way, to, um, in the sense that we, but um, maybe that's actually not right, what I said, but we, we, we're there in our little um, sort of black hole, feeling all these feelings, and yet I uh, recently I was this person I wow this person's got it all together, and this person just sat down and looked at me and said, and now we're going to just going to realise what a failure I am. And so although I'm the one that shows it to everybody, oh I'm a failure. And uh, so many other people are, are feeling exactly the same way. Mm -hmm. And so if you have that moment of like recognition, you know, it's the human condition, isn't mm -hmm. it? You know. And, and, and if, you, if you can if you can think about what um, has occurred in society for the the, the devil has um, shaped some of our society and the media and all, everything that we encounter, to do just that, to kind of make you feel as if you you are not valuable, you're not esteemed, you're not made in the image of God, it's just a myth. You're not, um, you know, his treasured possession. You're not the apple of his eye. You know, all those things get attacked very early on. And I don't think you even get to a teenager before there's some of that damage has been done already. Social you know? media itself shows yeah. the good parts of their lives. Say more about that. Can you say more about that? I was going to say, because nobody's going to post about the, the bad best. stuff about mm -hmm. themselves and their insecurities, you know. Mm -hmm. You're only going to get the good side of them. So people looking at someone else's profile or whatever they post, it seems like they've got it all together, because that's all the show. Yeah. You, don't, you don't get to know people. <coughs> yeah, that's right. I'm a bad one like that. I'll put on a brave face and I'll pretend that everything's okay and I'm doing fine and Rachel can tell you I've done this thousands of times. <laughs> and then I just fall to pieces. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, I don't have the strength to keep that brave face on, and I'm just like, I'm a wreck. Hmm. Everyone else is like, wait, what just happened? Well, we can talk together. What is this? <laughs> so, I mean, so, I mean, really, I mean, what are, what the message is, we can we can all drop the facade. I mean, I'm not talking about this group, what we're doing now. It's all about look at my sores and scars today. But definitely, as we break up from this, and it's people you trust, you can get into dialogue and prayer about these things, and say, hey support me a little bit, you know, help me, I don't think you put it in them words, but just say, you know, I want to just share with you a little bit about what's going on, because, you know, that is eroding my sense of worth in God, it, when I when I think about God, I sigh, and I, you know, it's a continual, like, oh, 
because you know, when we start seeing the description of God like that, the holy and righteous king who you know, knows everything and sees everything, he's all powerful and I'd sort of, I'm tripping up over the stupidest things in life, you know I feel a bit pathetic, mm-hmm. but God's like take out, I've overcome the world mm-hmm. and you becoming a Christian and you following me has been the first step of you being becoming fixed and you might never be fixed before your body falls to pieces or whatever, or you rapture or something but, um, but the, the, he has begun a good work, will complete it, because guess what happens? We get raised perfect in the end. So if I, if I stumble and fall for the next day, or however many years, you know, hopefully I get, don't just die in my bed from sickness, I don't want that to happen, you know. Um, but, you know, I die or something, and then I get resurrected with a new body. So, and then the faithfulness that I showed through that tripping up and all that kind of thing is what is the judgment for Christians, which it doesn't involve condemnation. Remember we talked about that? You're going to be judged by Jesus and he's going to look at you and he's going to say words, I don't know exactly what he's going to say, but it's, it's, it's about your faithfulness. Well done, good and Faithful servant. Witness. Yeah, witness servant. So he's, um, and then you'll get your crown and your position in the millennial reign based upon how you serve the unseen God. And we've said it before and he'll say it again, when we get to the millennial reign, there'll be people who are born into that. He go, of course, the God of all creation lives in Jerusalem. Why wouldn't that ever happen? And then you'll tell them a story saying, yeah, we believed him and we didn't even see him. And they're like, well, say what? <laughs> it's like, you believed and didn't see him? But Jesus said, blessed are those who we believe and don't see. You know, because we are a blessed generation. We we completely forget just who we're dealing with. And um, hopefully tonight it's been something to the throne room, the glorious and mighty king of all creation. I nearly asked you all to take your shoes off tonight, but because we have new people, that would have been weird. <laughs> yeah. So I just, yeah, but you know, you know, take your, sh- your shoes off because you're on holy ground. I nearly did that tonight. I talked to you about it, didn't I? But because all the new people came, I just thought I don't want to make it more weird than it might be perceived. It you know, so so we're a bit early tonight. We've only done an hour and something. So I mean, if we want to just ask more questions because this is important. We're going to go on to five, and we're going to talk about some pretty heavy Old Testament stuff next week. Title deeds and. The lamb who was slain and all that stuff, Rachel. I have a struggle that I've been thinking about for a couple of weeks, but not consciously thinking about, just been there. Um, I was just thinking, like, um, when you want to abandon your entire life to God, like, you, you know, I, I was just I was thinking about the, um, the rope analogy, where it's like, you know, this tiny little red section of the rope is your life, and then the rest of it, just imagine this rope goes on for eternity, is your Eternal life. eternal life and why are you worried about this red bit hmm. so like that that's kind of <clears> the <throat> back of my mind just saying like you know why am i worried about this red bit like what's the point on that um, and then like you know i want to abandon my entire life for god because that's the truth hmm. you know um but then like what do you do where do you draw the line where you end up becoming some religious zealot nut you know, like, so, so, so to answer that is, that, is that, that yeah, that there is a danger that you can have zeal without wisdom, mm-hmm. and that means that you're bouncing off all the walls and everyone's looking at you going, well, you're a complete yeah. lunatic. So, so followership, not fellowship, followership, saying, God, I want to more sell out to you and I want to more follow you, is less to do with the actions that come from that than the heart that's laid before God mm-hmm. in submission, yielding, and abandonment. So, so to get this in the right order. You don't define your soul outness by running around doing stuff. Mm-hmm. You just place yourself gently and silently before God. Perhaps not even silently, petitionally. You can just say, God, I'm yours. Or at least I think I am. That's my, that's my prayer. Mm-hmm. I, I want to be yours. I want my intent is that I'm yours. And I'm given over to you. But I can't know the full extent to which I am yours. I can only give you what I know is giveable. So there's parts of us which are rock solid still in rebellion against God. Sorry, but it's true. The scriptures tell us. The scriptures out us about that. So right, so daily, and I mean daily, you don't have to do a big ceremony or anything. But just go, God, I will unreservedly lay my heart out before you for you to come and accost it by, by your spirit and you know work and all that. And that might mean some trials and it might mean some joys. And it might mean the, because you know a rainbow, which we started off, and it's great that we're going to end with this, is raining and light. It's the joys and it's the pain. Mm-hmm. yeah. And when them two combine, you get a beautiful rainbow which encircle, encircles the throne of God. Not yours, Will, but you know, it's like that. I have multiple things. First of all, Thursday is amazing. Slow down. I can't follow you at that point. And if I can't follow you, there's a few people probably <laughs> can't follow you. You were talking way too fast. 
second of all, man. Which bit? Just then. I what, just which bit didn't you get? Because I'll explain it. Right, I'm just a bit slow today, okay. Is it about the, the bit where you don't define your your your, um, your um, abandonment to God by doing things? It doesn't mean right. I have to do yeah. more things. Yeah, I, I got. I got which it. bit didn't you get? That's all right. Don't worry about it. No, no, okay. no. T- tell us, because like mm. there may be other people who don't want to say what they didn't get. And just going just over it again is all it's all good. All good. Um, second of all. I think that connects really well with those who you're working God, if you're looking at selling out in the dark. Um, it's more of the fact you're faithfully walking with God in the fact that you're faithfully walking in God then presents good witness to people. So if you're sitting there and, and walking with God nicely, and then whenever someone asks you, you're constantly saying, yeah, I'm fine, I have no problem, don't worry, I'm perfect. That's a false witness to God, and in fact, you're the opposite you want to do. Because then people have that wrong opinion. Exactly. So yeah. you're living for God as a witness to God, and that's your full following and being a witness is your you're living the best you can be until the finish line hmm. by following the Lord, and then by doing doing that and then saying you're completely fine and have no troubles ever is then a false witness, which is almost counteracting whatever whatever you're whatever you're following yeah. with relationship with God is having. So if you're bearing your life to witnesses Something. and people that ask you about Jesus, and saying, yeah, okay, I've got a really difficult life, but when I have a difficult life, I've got my faith in Christ, and look at the awesome things that happen afterwards, and it's not me, because I know it's on me, because I'm a wretched sinner. So that's when it comes it comes in contact with all those three things. Yes, yeah, so, and, and um, one of the things, I mean, just to wrap this up, is you remember when we talked about the throne room, and, you know, a, a rainbow has got seven colours in it and um, there's seven of them before the throne of God it turns out there's the lamb will have seven eyes which is also the seven spirits of God so the rainbow's got seven elements to it the, so the seven lampstands will have um, seven. seven elements to it and the seven eyes um, so I don't know what you do with all that but certainly the rain that come, come you know I'm not saying that one around the throne was anything to do with rain, but the way we understand a rainbow is going back to Noah and the rainbow that he put in the sky as a covenant that he wouldn't flood the earth again, but he's going to blow it up, just saying. Um, and that, that kind of thing is through rain. God brings the rainbow. God brings the rain. Now, just to tie this up, I think what Blake's trying to say is we can easily try to make it rain by making God, you know, and, and a lot of churches do this. A lot of people are trying to make it rain. They're trying to make something happen. Instead of just silently just going, look, why don't we just do what he said? Sit and wait for him to do something. There's another praise report tonight because Anne-Marie's uh, dad, I don't know whether it's a healing of leukemia, but certainly he's gone back and his bloods are better. Right? She's had a tumour which is gone for some reason. Nearly strangled her trying to detect it. And uh, the old Ethan saga where he's still got headaches, but he's not had the hemiplegic thing going on yet. And... Um, so, you know, no, God is doing so. So we, we are not trying to make rain. We're just trying to say, God, who has a rainbow around the throne, and he's sat there looking like a diamond, right, with weird creatures going round it, and wheels intersecting wheels, and elders sat there chucking the crowns on the floor, and lightning and thunder and peals and all that. How can we help that person do anything? <laughs> yeah. Why don't we just abandon and say, no, you're the one who's got all glory and power and wisdom and you've got all the things sorted, you've got your signed off on it, and we're just waiting for you to come and, and bring it. the rain. Lord, bring the rain. Bring the rain to this group. Bring the rain to anyone who you deem, but it's you who brings the rain. And what's the rain? It's the work of the Holy Spirit amongst us. You know? And I think, um, just for example as well, um, how much more blessed are we whenever Henry says something about her life with the, uh, the uh, tumors and stuff like that. Mm. I mean, how much should, would she have taken away from this group if she just said, no, I'm going to explain Yeah. Mm. You know what I mean? So the witness part is extremely, part, not, extremely important, not just to the people that aren't saved, to be but the genuine. people that are saved, because that's what we're called to be. It's to be genuine, yeah. mm-hmm. and, and show them that, you, you know, I don't have this all together, but... 
Mm-hmm. I've got someone to lean on. I've got someone to trust in. Yeah, exactly. And sometimes that makes, if, you, if you're doing that and saying, I'm perfectly fine, I'm actually perfect, don't worry about me, it makes you almost a joke as well. People don't believe that. So, the person of God who we're describing tonight gave all power and authority and dominion to Jesus. And the plan is to bring everything under Jesus' lordship. Mm-hmm. You becoming a Christian is bringing yourself under his lordship. And that's why he's working in your life, to conquer you. Because he's not going to judge you for condemnation. So you're coming to him and saying, fix me, because I'm recognising that I'm broken. And that's what he's doing. And what you're coming under his, you're under his plan, you come under his lordship. And um, yeah, so that's, a, that's the picture, that's exactly what's going on. We do know what God's doing. You know? Yeah, certainly scripture. I think it makes me think that um, without our problems, without our struggles, and without the opportunities in the movie, obviously, but um, we wouldn't be able to prove, show ourselves the existence of God, right? Because um, we would, you know, um, how, how, how is it? How can you prove the existence of God? If Everything's perfect. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, a perfect, lively, you know, um, some people have blessed lives, but it's still not perfect. Mm. Yeah. There's mm. a philosophical theory that you cannot experience joy without experiencing pain mm. or trouble or hardship. Mm. So, how can we truly know God's blessing if, if we, we haven't had time? when we feel like God's abandoned us, even though like he never does. That's why people come into a lot of money at the most miserable people on earth, because they solve money, their problems by throwing money at it, so they don't really have any problems. But then they go down the tubes because they're like, I don't really get anything to compare this life with now. And then, can you imagine having everything that you wanted? God waits and lets you go through a period of time before giving you something, so that the richness of when he gives it to you will be full and whole and complete, yeah. right? So if you got what you wanted on request, the, that, that, when we talked about God creates a void to speak in it, into it, right? So thank him for the void, because when he speaks into a void, it's creative power that he speaks into it. And, um, and when, when we're waiting for something and we're getting impatient for it, as we all do, um, and it kind of niggles at us and gets us down, well, there's a design in that, because we, we're being hollowed out for his glory and if we can keep waiting and be, be a bit more patient and try and just kind of like not react you know and well he's just going to bless you he's just going to speak into that void and then the thing that's coming he gives it you at the right timing so that everything falls into place and it's the blessing that he intended for you because when you're blessed he's happy mm-hmm. he loves it when he blesses us but we're too busy trying to wrestle with him and you know, get him in an headlock and stuff like that. And, you know, he's on his head trying to, you know, persuade him. Arm up the back. And he just wants us to just be still and know that he is God. And know that he is that person we've just been talking about. I mean, come on. I've said it a lot of times. He's made out of diamonds, for goodness sake. <laughs> Have you ever met anyone made out of diamonds except that Terminator person? And possibly the Predator. <laughs> he looked like he was made out of diamonds. Because, you know, God isn't made out of diamonds. He just looked like he was. Light radiates from him. And the frost and the yeah, light, light, just, light just radiates from him. I, I, yeah. I think the good point is Beautiful from light. Yeah. Have you ever seen a diamond? I haven't seen many of them. Yeah. But they're just outrageous. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, the di- diamonds, I mean, I never used to bother to think about diamonds, but when you see the perfection and the beauty. Well, I've got an engagement ring, I have it, I don't wear it at the moment because um, one of the claws are loose and that and don't want to lose it. but. It's tiny, it's not a big diamond, but when it, the light hits it, it's just sparkles like. And it's just it's amazing. You know, like, <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. Somebody once said that a diamond's made by um, carbon being under sustained pressure mm-hmm. from heat. So mm-hmm. think of it that way. You know, God's trying to produce his image diamond. in you, and it can only happen through extreme heat and pressure. So when you're going through that day and you just. Um, like, oh, <laughs> just like, just try and, I don't, I'm not very good at this, but try and take heart and just go, you know, God's at work and we'll rejoice. Sit back and go, okay, he's trying to make a diamond again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 I'll be shinier at the end of this. <laughs> there's a song, uh, there's a song yeah. making diamonds. Yeah, it comes on like eight, five a lot. <laughs> You're referring to the song. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.
reflect his pre- you'll, ref- you'll reflect his glory once you get diamonds going. You'll um, be tra- more transparent and you'll be worth a lot more. You know what I mean? He's kind of like you'll you'll realise you're worth a lot more. And it's the same as well because the value of diamonds is actually you know probably nothing but Oh really? <laughs> Let's pray. Let's just shut this down. So Father, we um we are astounded by what we're shown in your word that you look like. I don't actually think we can get our heads around it, Lord. Um we have been mind battered for many years by the evil one and we want to be free from that we want to get your word into us and allow that to set us free loosen chains break chains discard fetters lord that are in our life in our thinking in our practices and lord, we want to be free mm-hmm. help us to get a full um image of who you are to us and help us to restore our self-worth self-esteem our sense of value our sense of belonging our sense of sonship our sense of family with you as our father so lord um, give us that ability this week as we um go into our lives and we um we uh, do what we do just um, let us be blessed with being free uh, it's a liberty warfare lord and we um we want to be in the fight but freed in it in jesus name amen